going to take the north and never give it back. So that's a good pick. You get the corner. It's, I got to go bold, right? I got to go bold for this. Oh, yeah. She's, She's got some nice long Welcome back to the Unbearable Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Barron. Make sure to like and subscribe out there on YouTube. It helps out the channel so much. And also rate the show five stars everywhere that you get your podcast. Just search for Unbearable Sports and welcome in to the final position preview because we have to talk about the quarterback and we have to break down in a lot more depth. What can we expect out of Caleb Williams too? And I know that camp is going on right now. We're going to also have you updated about everything that's going on with camp. It's, it's busy time right now. Busy mode is on. So today we're really just kind of talking about the quarterbacks that we have on the team, talk about the departures and last but not least, just break down. Did we get better at this position and talk about those expectations and even yes, Austin Reed, the undrafted rookie free agent that we got and what to expect actually out of him. So without further ado, let's get into it and let's talk about the departures for the Chicago Bears at quarterback. And yes, we're talking about Nathan Peterman <laughs> and and Justin Fields, right? So this obviously was the biggest notable departures that we have like we all remember the Justin Fields Civil War of 2024 and what that did to our fan base. But basically, this is what we had last year. Last year was Justin Fields. And at this time, we had P.J. Walker as the number two quarterback. Then we had Nathan Peterman as the third string and Tyson Bajant as number four. And the storylines going in were, what are we going to see out of Justin Fields? And I still felt like, what we talked about was ultimately what we got out of Justin Fields. At training camp, he looked better, and he looked better during the season, but it wasn't enough. And that's the reason why now we see Caleb Williams as the number one quarterback. Right now, Tyson Bagent is now number two. Brett Rippon is number three. And Austin Reed, which we'll talk about later, is number four. And the whole depth piece of this, too, I think is up for debate. Because even with Tyson Bajan as the number two quarterback, you know, quote unquote, you still have a veteran in Brett Rippon kind of replacing Nathan Peterman with Rippon. And then now you have Tyson Bajan as the primary backup with Austin Reed being that can this undrafted rookie free agent do anything on this team? And now we'll break that down a little bit later. But first we got to talk about some player breakdowns and probably the moment that everybody's waiting for if wanted to get, get this out there early. Let's talk about Caleb Williams and just a little bit about him. Now, actually, before we even go into that, I, I forgot. I had one other piece I wanted to talk about and that's Geno Smith. <laughs> why, why are we previewing Geno Smith? You might ask. And that's because I wanted to talk about Geno Smith with the Seattle Seahawks because that was a Shane Waldron system. So I wanted to understand a little bit more about Geno Smith and how he threw the football last season. And so for those that are watching, you can see some of the numbers. I'll just say this out loud just so everyone that's listening can understand this. They didn't throw it that much deep. And actually, I have some stats up here. They were middle of the road for play action with Geno Smith. They were 13th out of um, 24 different quarterbacks out there. They were um, middle of the road for deep passes, or Geno was middle of the road for deep passes, 13th among 23 quarterbacks. Intermediate, um, in the intermediate percentage, he was actually last with Patrick Mahomes out of 21 quarterbacks. Short percentage was middle of the road. So really what you're seeing here is that they were really just kind of all over the place. They didn't specifically attack one portion, except Geno, I guess, did not attack the middle of the field or the intermediate um, zone, not the direct middle, but just the intermediate one when you're talking about the depth of the field. But really everything was kind of middle of the road. And behind the line of scrimmage was 18th out of 37, so they're not throwing you with the Luke Getze screens all the time. And six in ball out less than two and a half seconds, which was 48.1%. So a couple things there that I want to just highlight is that where the ball goes from last year with Geno Smith was that when you look at the percentiles, 
it's kind of all over the place. It's really not like this is a deep ball offense. This is a short game offense. When you look at this across the board, it's everywhere. They, they expect you to just kind of throw the ball everywhere, and that's a good indicator for this offense. But also, with that time out in less than two and a half seconds, that's huge for Caleb Williams, especially because he did hold on to the ball a little too long at USC because he was always trying to play that hero ball and make the big play. So, with that and getting the ball out, we'll see if they speed up Caleb Williams' timing, which I really hope they do because, listen, you got three good wide receivers, two good tight ends, so why not just try and get the ball out there a little bit quicker than expected? But also, too, if we're talking about a little bit about Geno Smith, I, uh, for those that are watching, I have his PFF grades out there as well, but just overall, they didn't do one thing more so that jumps off the tape. The only thing is that that intermediate was the lowest percentage out of all quarterbacks, but Maho but tied with Mahomes for the last. So it's not like it's something that they just do not do. It's also what K KC does as well. So all over the place, well-rounded offense. So there really wasn't a great thing that I could grab from what Geno Smith did and said, hey, we're going to see more short passes. And to be honest, they might be switching this up with Caleb Williams. And currently, no one can really report what types of plays they're running even though some little things are kind of sneaking out through the cracks with some of these private practices. But now, let's get into Caleb Williams, shall we? So with Caleb Williams, we all know number one pick, and the big comp to me is Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, and it's all about the arm talent. We, we've, we've talked about Caleb Williams a whole bunch, right? We know it's the arm talent, but also to the, the confidence that he plays with that's the thing that really is standing out. We had so many so many questions and so many fake news articles about Caleb Williams being this prima donna. And honestly, the more that I learn about Caleb Williams, the better. And even the contract situation. My dad and I, this weekend, we were just having a couple drinks, just like sitting out on the porch, just talking. And I was like, listen, Caleb Williams to me, I love the way that he handled his, his contract situation. And anyone that's like, well, he asked for the franchise tag. When you're in a contract negotiation, you ask. You, you bring stuff up. And I love hearing the people from ESPN 1000 talk about this because they have contracts. And they say, like, listen, I've thrown random things into the contract and you get laughed out of the room. He brought it up and they said no. And then after that, he brought up being charged as an LLC, which is phenomenal business. And if I'm the if I'm a player and I hear that my quarterback was trying to get the most money and by going through an LLC, that is awesome because you're looking out for every single player. Like the NFL Players Association is probably going to go back and say, hey, this whole thing that Caleb was talking about, that's brilliant. That's them working like the rich do with an LLC. Like you work with an LLC, you can then write off those expenses. And then also you have better tax benefits because Illinois has crazy taxes. So it's just all smart things. The not forgivable loan that he was talking about too, just really smart, good head on his shoulders. But let's talk a little bit about the actual play of Caleb Williams. Because the actual play of Caleb Williams, he does attack the middle of the field and you look at this 15 of 18 when you're talking about deep passes um over 20 yards last season 29 of 49 when in that intermediate in the middle of the zone two interceptions though but then in the short he had 88 passes he was 70 for 88 when it was 0 to 10 in the middle of the field which is something that we want to see because we didn't see a lot of that with Justin Fields he did not throw it to the outside but when you're looking at just the numbers, let's just say the intermediate, he had 49 passes in between, like in between the numbers, and then he had 11 to the left, and then he had 14 to the right. So yet again, more passes in the middle of the field than he did to the outside. Then from zero to 10, we're talking 88 in the middle, 21 to the left, 25 to the right. He attacks the middle of the field, which is a huge sign of a quarterback that Want, that does well <laughs> like that's what that's how 
these new age systems dominate is because it's right up in front. It's easier to just throw those darts to. When you see Jaden Daniels, all his throws, and even Justin Fields, it was always to the outside. It was never in the middle because that's a little scary, right? You need to understand where everybody's at with the defense. The fact that he threw that many passes and only two interceptions in the middle of the field, very, very impressive. So to me, just more things to love about Caleb Williams. And we already know about the arm talent, just next level darts that he throws. So now let's talk about some of these backups, starting with the man out of Shepard, Tyson Bajan, 24 years old, getting paid a little less than $1 million, going into his second season, 6'3", 213. And keep in mind too, Caleb Williams, 6'1", 215. So Williams a little bit more rocked up, but a little bit shorter. And last season, Tyson Bajant threw for 859 yards, three touchdowns, six interceptions. I failed to remember the whole six interceptions thing, right? We all love Bajant. And it's like, oh yeah, he did throw six interceptions. PFF grade of 57.7. He appeared in five games last season and was two and two as a starter last season. So fun little fact there but also was a very high short distance thrower. 16% of his throws were screens. <laughs> so kind of just showed you what they thought of Tyson Bajan just with those screens. And yet again, Getsy did call a whole bunch of screens. He also did have 23 carries for 109 yards and two touchdowns while rushing the football and also was the fourth string quarterback for jumping over everybody else and getting into that number two quarterback role. So the big question here, can he maintain that backup spot? And I think with Tyson Bajan, I think he can maintain that backup spot because he's because who else is going to take that? You know, we'll break down Brett Rippon and Brett Rippon. You don't want him coming in. And I've always kind of had this opinion when your backup has to come in. You're going to be going against a starting quarterback. Chances are you're going to lose that game anyways. Obviously, you want your backup to be as good as possible. I like the idea of Tyson Bajant, but I think it has more to do with what you think you need at that quarterback position. Because if you think that Tyson Bajant gives you a similar play style and you don't have to change it that much from Caleb Williams, then play Bajant. I also really, he has that good mobility to his game like with the over 100 yards rushing. So I think that their play styles can be fairly similar. But it's still the question of the deep ball. When I remember seeing Tyson Bajant throw it out there in camp, and I'm going, this guy throws like me, which I am not an NFL quarterback. And when he was bombing it, he was kind of like lame ducking it a little bit. He does have a powerful arm in that short to intermediate range, but that deep ball, and I'm looking at the stats right now, 0 for 4, Past 20 yards to the left, one of two past 20 yards down the middle, and two of six on the outside um, past 20 yards. So yet again, those deep passes, not really getting a lot of that. He was more so throwing everything short because 10 plus, three of six to the left, six of 11 down the middle, and four of seven to the outside right. Then everything else, it was 14 passes from zero to 10, 24, 30, 23, like he's, he was more comfortable in that short range. Cause that's really what complements his arm. It's, it's that quick bullet, but when you have to, when you have to cork it deep, I think that's where there's still some questions. So I think that's going to be the big thing about him being the number two quarterback, but let's talk about someone who a lot of people think could be, could dethrone Tyson Bajan, and that's Brett Rippon going into his fifth season out of Boise State, 6'2", 202. So another slightly smaller stature quarterback, 27 years old, cap hit of under $1 million, passing yards of 172 last season, and one interception completion percentage of a lovely 47.4%. Now last season started 1.5 games for the Rams, and that's where he has some familiarity with this whole McVay type of system that the Bears should be running, that we kind of expect him to be running. And that's also why he might just be the new Nathan Peterman, where he kind of can help Caleb Williams with no threat to kind of be that true backup and also hoping that no one kind of pawns him off or steals him off of your practice squad. 
So I really do see him as more of the veteran presence in the locker room. But he did play a lot of snaps in his 2022 season. So he had four games of experience, 483 yards, two touchdowns, and four interceptions. Not great. So can he overthrow the great Tyson Bajan? And that's where I I don't see that there's a lot of ups. I'd rather see a Bajan in than Brett Rippon. You know who Brett Rippon is. You don't know who Tyson Bajan is. We're still just talking about backup quarterbacks, and hopefully we never have to see them actually in there. But that's why I still feel Bajan number two, and then you have Brett Rippon more as that veteran presence. So now let's talk about the last one that I think a lot of us are intrigued by. And that's Austin Reed, rookie out of Western Kentucky, 6'2", 220. Yet again, we're not, we're not getting these skyscraper-esque quarterbacks. We're getting these shorter stature for quarterbacks type of a player. Now, Austin Reed, his, his big strength, middle of the field. And we haven't talked much about him, but he actually attacked the middle of the field a whole bunch. That was his bread and butter. He had 116 passing attempts, middle of the field from 0 to 10 yards, 48 from 10 to 20, and 17 from 20 plus. But then when you look outside of that, like from 0 to 10, it was 26 on the left, 26 on the right. From 10 plus, 16 on the left, 22 on the right. 20 plus, nine, uh, 30 on the outside left, 27 on the outside right. So he was really in that middle of the field from that 0 to 20 range, really bulk of his throws were coming in there and really has no fear with attacking the middle of the field, which yet again is something that people are looking for. And he does kind of remind me a little bit of Tyson Bajan where it's the, but Tyson Bajan has a better arm than I'd say with Austin Reed. Austin Reed to me, you don't see him. He, he's one of those guys that only throws the fastball doesn't know how to put much touch on it. It's always this straight dart that he throws. But also, too, he transferred from Southern Illinois, went to West Florida, and then ultimately went to Western Kentucky, where he ended up in 2023 throwing for 3,340 passing yards, 31 touchdowns, 11 interceptions, and then in 2022 had 4,746 passing yards, 40 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. So. One other thing that I want to throw out there, beyond five yards, his adjusted completion percentage is 52.4. That's terrible. And that's what I'm talking about with this arm talent. This guy can throw it in between the hashes. He's not afraid to throw it in between the numbers. But that deep ball, you're not going to see it. <laughs> you're really not going to see it at all. And when you look at it, nine for 30 on the outside left, 11 uh, past 20 yards, then past 20 yards for the outside right, 11 of 27, three of 17, over 20 yards in between the numbers. Like, yet again, terrible percentages from 10 to 20 yards, from, from going left to right, six of 16, 26 of 48, and five of 22. That's what we're talking about, where this guy does not really have that arm. He's just trying, he does, he could, only knows how to throw fastballs, and that's where really the arm talent is is off. Is It's really not there. And I think that's where Austin Reed, you see the numbers and you're like, oh, dude, this is Gardner Minshew. This is, this is amazing. The arm talent just is simply not there. He's an aggressive quarterback. I think he's going to be fun to watch at, at camp. I think he's going to be fun to watch in the preseason, but I think – the deep ball, it's it's a little ugly. Like, that stat is, is really, really bad. But that's our quarterbacks. That's all four of them. So let's just kind of go through some over-unders, talk about did we get better, and then we can wrap up the player profiles officially. Now, now it'll feel like the start of the season. So let's go through some over-unders real quick. So the over-unders that we have here are really just about Caleb Williams. And this is actually the betting lines. Um, some of these are betting lines that I found online. So to start, passing yards, 3,500 for Caleb Williams. What are we thinking? Over or under for Caleb? And to me, I might be going bold with this. I, I'm drinking the Caleb, the Caleb Kool-Aid. I'm going over. 
And I know we've talked about this with rookie quarterbacks that there's not a lot that have thrown for over 4,000 yards. But I think when you look at the talent that this team has, I don't know how you... I, I think it feels like it's going to be over 3,500. It feels like he's going to get past that number. And I would take the over. i very optimistic about what Caleb is doing. Everything out of camp is fairly optimistic about what he's capable of doing, what he's going to be doing. So to me, that's over. And then we have passing touchdowns to 23 and a half. I'm going to go over as well. I think that they're going to feel comfortable. I, I'm not as comfortable about the 23 and a half as I am with the 3,500 because I just feel with touchdowns, maybe they might just say, hey, we can just run it in. Let's just run it with Swift. Let's just do these simple things. But when you have Komet and you have Roma Dunze, who's, a, who's someone that you can lob the ball to and he can take it. You have also a Keenan Allen, big body, short quickness in the slot. That's where I think he could kind of go past that. So then offensive rookie of the years, I set the mark at 0.5. Will he win it? There's a reason why he's the favorite quarterbacks get this award and I just yet again going into one of the best situations out there and I think also with him and his personality if the Bears are winning games people are going to go dude Caleb's the guy he's if he's good his personality is just going to amplify it that much better so to me I'm going over and last but not least Pro Bowl at point five, whew, it, it might be close because you look at the other NFC North, I mean the NFC quarterbacks, and there's not as many as we once had. A lot of the big name quarterbacks are in the AFC. So if you do just like a quick mental scan and like just NFC North, you're talking Jordan Love, probably not going to get a lot of votes unless he does look like the second coming of Aaron Rodgers. Or you're not going to get anything out of Minnesota. Goff, I find it hard. Like he's kind of one of those in-between quarterbacks that may or may not. I think he has a chance, but I'm going to say under for this one at least. I think he will have a chance, and I think also with Chicago, if he is doing well, we might just put him in just because. <laughs> you know, that's that's the thing. Is like We just might put him in, honestly, just because we love our players. We love, we love them, and if our quarterback can look halfway decent, we'll be all on board. So now, to put the cherry on top, did we get better at the quarterback position? And I, I think it's easy to say. I think that Justin Fields, and I haven't talked a lot about him during this episode. Justin was a super fun quarterback to watch, someone that I enjoyed watching. But he was not throwing the football. And he, there was a lot of things that, it, when watching the tape, was very frustrating to see. And that you don't see when watching the game. And when you watch the tape and you go, he's looking at that person and he's open. And why is he just simply not throwing the football? I wish the best of Justin Fields. But I think when you, I and I do think when you compare this, you have to factor in Justin's running ability with Caleb's, pat, like with his passing ability too. And I think Caleb is not going to be running the football a lot because he is the franchise. And, but I do think he's going to be passing it more, and I do think he's going to be better at passing the football. And I think something you also need to factor in is Justin did cause turnovers in the fourth quarter, and you saw what we did in the fourth quarter, and we blew a lot of these big leads, and there was that, cl like that clutch factor that just wasn't there that we saw, and just the amount of turnovers that Justin did take on I'm going to go that we got better. And I just, I really do think that Caleb can come in and play better than what Justin was giving us. And I think that is why we are so optimistic about this team. And, and if you haven't already go through and watch all the different position profiles, we go into some great depth about every single player. And just as a spoiler alert, just to kind of put a bow on this, we said that the bears got better in basically every single position except for that defensive line. That defensive line, we lost some players, and at this current moment, as I'm recording this, we have not added anybody that has been added to this defensive this defensive line group, except for Austin Booker, who's more of that rookie. It's just an exciting time to be a Bears fan because 
This team is on the up. This also, even with the defensive line, reasons for optimism, like a Javon Dexter. Can he take that next step? It's just a fun atmosphere, and I can't wait till these practices start to become public, and then we get more information, and we see this team out there, and we watch HBO. I'm really excited about this, and if you're excited too, and if you're watching still, make sure to just drop a like. It helps out the channel tremendously. We're going to keep you covered on all things Chicago Bears, so make sure to subscribe and also download the podcast. It's free everywhere you get your podcast. Just go to your phone, search for Unbearable Sports, rate five stars. It helps out tremendously. And with that, Unbearable Sports Podcast, we are out. Yeah, she's got some nice long hair and